Hi everyone, I'm Eric Dudley, Artistic Director for the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players, and I want to welcome you to another presentation in our online series, How Music is Made. For today's program, we'll be presenting a performance of a truly unique and enigmatic work, The Concert for Piano and Orchestra by John Cage, featuring contemporary players pianist Kate Campbell as soloist, and a brilliant solo choreography by Bay Area deaf dancer and artistic director, Antoine Hunter. For me, Cage's Concert for Piano and Orchestra is one of those pieces that has a kind of timeless, ageless quality to it. Even though it was written in the late 1950s, it still somehow manages to sound just as fresh and unconventional today as it must have sounded at its premiere more than 60 years ago. Part of the reason why is that, like a lot of Cage's other pieces, there is no traditional full score for the music. Instead, it's an assemblage of individual instrumental parts where each player has a pretty great degree of freedom in terms of how they choose to execute it. And so by its very design, it's a kind of piece that can sound very different from one performance to the next. Hi, I'm Kate Campbell. I'm the pianist for the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players. Performing the concert for piano and orchestra by John Cage was one of the most fun and creative projects that um, I've been able to do in a long time. The amount of preparation and choice that goes into preparing this work before you even get to the first rehearsal um, is really fascinating. And so I'm excited to be able to share a little bit of this process with you. John Cage was born in Los Angeles in 1912 and spent the majority of his creative life between California and New York. And his two main teachers of composition were Henry Cowell, the great American experimentalist composer, and Arnold Schoenberg, the father of the 12-tone system of composition and founder of the Second Viennese School. Cage approached Schoenberg for lessons when the European master was living in Southern California, and Schoenberg agreed to teach him for a period of years free of charge. And it was with Schoenberg that Cage had one of his first great ideological clashes. Essentially, Schoenberg said to Cage, you'll have to develop a better sense of harmony, or you'll keep coming up against a wall as a composer for the rest of your life. And Cage's enigmatic response was to say, well, then I'll keep hitting my head up against that wall. It was after moving to New York and falling in with a whole different group of composers and creators that Cage became most fascinated with the idea of using elements of chance and indeterminacy in his music, especially after receiving a copy of the Chinese I Ching as a gift from student and fellow composer Christian Wolff. Cage was interested in using the I Ching as a part of the compositional process in the same way as it had been used for centuries as a method of divination to try and come up with a randomized ordering of musical elements and ideas, which for Cage better approached the kind of beauty and randomness that we find in nature. The more interested Cage became in having elements of indeterminacy in his music, the more license he started giving to performers in some of his pieces to play an even more active role in the actual creative process. And it's this kind of agency on the part of the performers that's most on display in a piece like the Concert for Piano and Orchestra. Even though there's a full set of instrumental parts with very specific musical ideas and notations by Cage, he also makes it plain in the instructions for the piece that it's largely up to the performers to decide on an individual basis how exactly each of those musical gestures should sound, in which order they should occur, and which ones should be played or left out. The length of the work is also up to the performers to determine, 
and even the makeup of the ensemble is flexible. So the piece can exist in different versions depending on the choice of the performers. So when I received the part for the concert for piano and orchestra, the piano part is a box, a large box of 53 loose pages. And on each page, there are any number of musical cells. So just a little bit of music floating on the page. Some of it is um, graphically notated, which means the way that it looks is gonna affect the way that it sounds. Some of it looks pretty similar to composed music that we're all familiar with, but you can tell there's a little something different going on. And some of it looks nothing like the music that we're all used to seeing. And um, I knew that it was gonna take a lot of exploration to decipher what was going on there. So each cell on the page is labeled with a letter. And at the very beginning of the score, there are two pages of handwritten performance notes by John Cage. And it basically reads like an instruction manual. So if you go through these performance notes, you will learn that each musical cell is basically its own musical alternate reality. There are different rules that apply, different sounds, different choices that apply to that particular notation. After my several weeks of um, interpreting these instructions, and making my choices, it was time to put my own piano part together for this performance. I still didn't really know how to do that. I had interpreted all of these musical cells, but um, any choice that I was going to make about how to put it together seemed a little bit meaningless. So I decided to take a page out of John Cage's playbook and make it random. Um, but I put a modern twist on it so I actually uh, downloaded a randomizer spinning wheel app on my phone and I put in um, all 84 letters of the score and um, I, I slightly altered it because some letters appear many times, some letters appear only once. So I made it proportional to that and I started to spin the wheel. And um, that told me how to put the score together. So there were actually three random selections that had to be made. I would choose on my phone um, which letter to perform, and then how much of that letter to perform, and um, how much silence would come before and after. And I, I would place that music on my own sheet of paper, um, basically on a big drawing pad, I'll show you. So one page of that would look like this. Some of them are more full, some of them are kind of empty. So there would be uh, a musical cell and a, a little note about how much of it to play, and then a little note about how much silence would follow it. And when that music reached about one minute, I would start a new page so that each page of my score was roughly one minute so that I could follow roughly with the conductor um, and still retain a little bit of my own freedom and we would um, hopefully end our interpretations of this piece at the same time. For our performance, we decided on a length of about 25 minutes just so the piece would have a real kind of concert length solo work feel. And the last kind of quirky element in that becomes the role of the conductor. And since each player is free to execute their part in whichever way they have chosen, there really is nothing to coordinate from a musical standpoint. So Cage simply asks the conductor to act as a kind of timekeeper literally marking the passage of time by simulating hands on a clock face. And with one more twist, he actually asks that those minutes pass faster or slower based on a set of timings that he's given in the instructions in the conductor's part. In other words, 
one minute may have an extra 15 seconds as a part of it, and another minute may only actually last for 30 seconds, and it's up to the conductor to just show the differences by the speed with which their hands are going around the clock. Now I can only guess as to why Cage might have been interested in having this element in the piece, but it does perhaps do something for the performers, who are in the moment of possibly still making decisions as to how exactly to execute the decisions that they've already made. And perhaps seeing the urgency of a minute moving visually faster versus the relaxation of another minute moving much slower from a visual standpoint may actually still suggest something in the actual creation in performance. The final element of the concert for piano and orchestra is that it's also a partner composition to a dance piece by Cage's partner and longtime collaborator, Merce Cunningham. The title of that piece is Antic Meat, and just like Cage's musical composition, the dance composition is set up as a series of seemingly unrelated and randomized events. And the thing that's so apparent from the beautiful choreography created for us by dancer Antoine Hunter is the aesthetic that Cage and Cunningham were so fascinated with exploring for the majority of their creative work together, which is essentially that music and dance could function as separate and equally independent elements successfully in the same piece. The hundreds and hundreds of small choices that I made with this score, as well as the random selections that helped put our performance together, really only scratch the surface of how someone could interpret this piece. There are infinite numbers of choices to make and interpretations to follow. Um, there's no definitive performance or recording to rely on. Um, there is a wonderful quote from John Cage, which says, I must find a way to let people be free without their becoming foolish, so that their freedom makes them noble. And I really kept that at the heart of my process and felt that it kind of created this collegial feeling with, um, with John Cage and with the spirit of the piece. It's an amazing thing as a performer to get to work on putting together a piece of music like this, where everyone really feels as individual artists that they all have a role in the creative and compositional process. We had great fun putting it together and we want to thank you for joining us for this online presentation and hope you enjoy the performance.